is we're doing part three, where we're going to talk about tow plane accidents, both recent ones and ones that the NTSB reports have come out on. Motor gliders, the same thing, and also some prior accident updates. Super quick housekeeping. You may have seen this in the pre-show. Everybody asks about wings credits. We'll get those uploaded in a couple of days. We are doing the recording, so hopefully it's available for those that miss it, or also for reference. Some of the accidents uh, you'll see tonight, the prior ones, we went over in maybe some more detail uh, last year. So you can take a look at that, hopefully. Do also give consideration to some wing safety courses that have a gliding bend to them. I won't say they are directed at glider pilots necessarily, but have a gliding bend to them. And do take a look at the handouts. There is actually fairly substantial PDF document that is the note pages for this evening. And we have that classic disclaimer of we try to do the best that we possibly can uh, covering what we do know. There are times where we don't necessarily know all of the information or the information um, that we're given may not agree. Uh, I know we had it with one of them. It was the case on the NTSB final report. Uh, they had the wrong end number on it. And someone from the club advised us of that. And that actually made it much easier for me. So thank you, because I was then able to go to find our FAA stuff that I was really having to dig for. Uh, we do our best to try to present the facts, just the facts, ma'am, uh, if you're from that age where you remember that TV show and try to avoid speculating. But we want to make you aware of what are the things that you can learn from these accidents. And that's why we're doing this, to help us all learn, to understand really that even those that work really, really hard to avoid an accident are only human and can end up making a mistake. That's the case for all of us here, probably all of you out there too. Give some insights for teaching for the instructors out there to make your students better, your clubs better. Some insights for recurrent training, which is an important part of being a proficient pilot. And also just, you know, hey, what is important um, in the flying is having fun and doing it safely. And that's what we want to get across to you. And tonight is kind of that special one. This is oriented towards glider pilots, but glider pilots, we all have to. And if you're a tow pilot, you know, we have to give some love out there to the tow pilots because they're the ones that get us up and going out here, primarily in the U.S. We have very little winch operations in the U.S. right now. That's probably expanding. And we do want to help to make them safe also because it's teamwork between the glider pilots and tow pilots. This is just data from before uh, when it asked where people were from. We've got quite a few. Last time, series two or part two of this, we had about 410 of you on. Right now, I see about 300. And last year when we did this, this was a surprise to us. One of the poll questions we did was how many people on this program knew someone that was involved in an accident and nearly two thirds of the people did. Uh, you know, and we had then about 375. What we want, really wanna do is change this around. And some people do ask, you know, this gives you some FAA insight, but some also terrific insight to accidents and maybe a little bit better longer term is the Soaring Safety Foundation and their annual report. The executive summary should be coming out soon. Uh, they working on the final draft of their annual report. I, I heard from one of their members. Uh, so that'll be up very soon also. You know, they're dealing with the same challenges that we all do, <laughs> getting the data. And that's one of the things I want to ask all of you is the Soaring Safety Foundation and Soaring Society of America ask all the clubs for some data on launch and flight times of their club aircraft. And they're specifically doing it to try to get a better idea of how much glider flying there really is out there as compared to what uh, the FAA General Aviation Survey has to it. So I do wanna ask you to help them, you know, give them, if you can, the data for your club 
you know, club presidents get that. And also what I'd look at this is just a supplement to what they do with their annual report is I try to give you a little bit more insight because as a fast team program manager working for the FA, that's one of the things that I'm allowed to do. And that's what I try to do is give you some insight on what you might see in that soaring safety foundation in your report. Terms and verbiage. These are the terms we use. I'm not gonna go over them because I have in the prior ones, but just if you hear these. And what we'll do is we'll almost pretty much jump right in tonight, uh, not going over too many details. We've talked about the pure gliders, the 19 accidents there uh, in part two. Tonight, we're gonna talk about the two motor glider accidents and depending upon how you count it, <laughs> the one, two or three tow plane accidents um, that we have, the NTSB says two uh, for glider flying. There really only was one that was in the NTSB stuff, but there's a third accident that happened here kind of locally that I think is important for tow operations. So we're gonna talk about the tow planes review older accidents that the final reports have come out on and then cover the new ones, the motor gliders review and new. And if we still get some time, we'll hit upon some of the older glider accidents, pure glider accidents that the final reports have come out on recently also. So let's look at those tow plates out there because they help us get up and get going. First one is Osceola, Wisconsin. Uh, this is Again, older one that I'm updating. And what you'll see on the updates is anything that has changed since when I did this in prior years, I've put in red. So I'm gonna go through pretty quick, but it's the red hot, uh, color that you wanna be looking for. We do have information on the pilot, commercial pilot, age 50. Had a flight review nine months prior, about a thousand hours total time, 250 in the make and model the class two medical, the FAA did go on site. For the tow planes, I'm also covering information on the aircraft. The airframe here was 63 years old with a little bit over 7,000 hours total time on it. And you might be able to start to pick up on some things as to why I'm doing that <laughs> as we progress. Um, it was the fourth tow of the day. Pilot had talked about that, that's nothing new. But what it did do, which we saw in the initial accident pictures, but it was not being verbally broadcast, is a broken attachment fitting of the right horizontal stabilizer. And what they found when the FAA looked at it was pitting multiple broken welds and corrosion around the fracture, and that the right stabilizer frame had been fabricated and was not an FAA parts manufacturer approved uh, approval approved part. And we'll take a look at that. When exactly did that occur was hard to determine because it had been removed many times for inspection, refurbished, replaced, everything. The most recent time that it probably had been looked at was about six months prior. And I think that was about 70 hours a time, 60 hours a time, if I recall. I'm going off of memory there at the annual inspection. And you can see it here, and I'll highlight with the arrow, you can see where the horizontal stabilizer is flopped down, uh, almost looks like a reverse elevator with a stick all the way back, uh, but it should be attached right by that little um, black hole. Let's see, I get a laser pointer out, there we go, right up in that area, but you can see it flopped down here. We did notice that right on the initial um, accident photos. And they looked at it carefully. They, they sent the whole tail to, uh, to Piper Aircraft to have it disassembled and looked at. And this is the right stabilizer. Is This is where it would attach, where you see the yellow points back here is where the elevator is. So this is the leading edge. This is where it attaches the fuselage. And I'll point out with some arrows, but you'll see some things. I wanna point out first is notice the thickness of that support brace that's on the inboard portion of it. Also, you can see the breakage and pitting and corrosion in the corner, that's where it attaches. 
We also noted some uh, breakage and corrosion uh, back in this corner. And this compares to the other side. You look at this and you almost think, oh, that's what a brand new one looks like. This is actually what was on the left side of the same aircraft. Um, this is an, an approved part. It was in good condition, uh, was not the problem that we had, but to highlight there, notice down here that there's actually an additional sleeve uh, welded on that basically double wall thickness for the attachment point, which was not on the right-hand side. And comparatively, look at the channel bracket that is at the base portion of this and how thick and strong that is in comparison to what we saw on the other side that was bent and tweaked. So the probable cause was kind of straightforward. Uh, you know, failure of the right horizontal stabilizer during takeoff, loss of control and forced landing uh, did happen just barely airborne. Thankfully, the pilot did their best and hit soft things. So they got out of it pretty good. So, you know, again, like I said, you have to share the love for the tow pilots if they can walk away from it is terrific. And contributing to it was the installation of an unapproved stabilizer frame and failure of maintenance personnel to identify deterioration of the stabilizer during routine maintenance. So I throw in a few takeaways for this. And one is, you know, you go back to that airframe aspect of it. And this is something we're all dealing with. I've already brought it up, I think, but, you know, a challenge for everyone within the gliding community is the age and the condition of the tow fleet. Um, we are at the point, you know, it requires significant maintenance and significant rebuilds uh, on them to keep them up and going. It's not something that, not many of them are being made uh, anymore. It is very important on the maintenance as something gets older like this, we are kind of in restoration phases many times. So the maintenance on it is not just repair and put it out the door uh, all the time. Is sometimes it takes a bit more work. And also for the tow pilots and all of us is how sometimes it can be important to do an expanded pre-flight, uh, really, really look at the aircraft. Uh, what we call in the fast team, the advanced pre-flight. Um, you know, really take a look at it. And another thing I'm gonna mention, cause this could help in these type of situations and it's come up recently and has been talked about is helmets for tow pilots. Uh, I know a few NTSB members that have advocated for it and advocated for it for years. I know a couple clubs and tow pilots that do it. Uh, even if you did AVWEB, there was another good recent video uh, by Paul Bertarelli on it, and this is the link to it. That's the title, so if you just copy that thought about a helmet for flying, maybe you should, uh, and Google that on videos. And literally sitting over in a box right over here in the side of my office is one of these, the uh, David Clark K-10 helmets is, with COVID, I've spent more time in the tow plane the last couple of years than I think I have teaching and I fly some other aircraft that I have crossbars. I'm a fairly tall guy at about six foot two um, now, is crossbars up by my head and stuff and flying into not backcountry, but gravel, dirt, bumpy runways more often, you know, some bunch of private ones. And I just reached the point, I said, you know what? I've seen enough as a safety person for that type of flying. I think it's time that I have one. So I took a pair of old David Clarks, ordered that helmet in the process of getting it all put together. Uh, Bill or Daryl, either you guys or even Dan, I know you've done a lot of towing in years past, Dan, too. Any of you guys ever seen any tow pilots flying with um, helmets? Uh, Bill here. No, I haven't seen any uh, tow pilots flying with helmets. I think I've seen some videos uh, 
of uh, tow pilots, but personally, no. And uh, I've thought about it, especially in the turbulence out in the Midwest, in the desert Southwest, but uh, I didn't have a helmet. I, I have a military style helmet that uh, I know a couple of people have uh, tried to use it, but it's almost a little big and ungainly. Yeah, what is that, the G, H, or uh, H? Yeah, yeah, the big gray one, yeah. Yeah, I, I looked and I tried one of those one time, same thing, it just was a bit too much. But I, I, I don't know, we had right now, from what I know and understand, it's still classified as an incident. I know out west in some rough terrain, we had a um, tow plane ended up putting down um, off airport um, recently, just in the past month or two. And I don't know, but knowing what the terrain is, like you said, where it was out west, I, I was like, that could have been helpful. There's some comments coming up in the chat. I don't know if you're following it, Steve, that uh, they're yeah. identifying some different places where there's one or two pilots out there that do use it. Oh, good. And, and others at the same group may not. Yeah, well, I, just going through these tow plane accidents over the years, I've seen a few where it would have made a difference, uh, whether for the severity of the injuries, uh, possibly even for, you know, whether it was a fatality or not. And it really is, I think, just something to start thinking about. And I'm just putting it out there for all of us to think about. The next one is a dramatic accident. Uh, we talked about this before, but the final has come out uh, now. This one, both the NTSB and the FAA were on site. It was a double fatality. Uh, the aircraft was in a prior accident back in 2013, the same aircraft. Uh, some additional information that has come out. One pilot we knew was ATP, the other one commercial. They had 17,500, 5,000 hours. The 17,500 hour ATP, who is also a DPE in the past, um, had 2,000 hours in the L-19. He was the instructor. He knew the airframe uh, in teaching in it well. He had checked out a lot of tow pilots. Uh, the airframe basically had spent its entire life since being put together in the 70s uh, at Hawaii um, doing tow operations. There was no total time listed, but within the documentation, there were kind of the ability to make two estimates. One was the owner of the aircraft said that the aircraft uh, flew on average through all the years, 100 hours per quarter, which would have put it at over 16,000 hours. Uh, there's also some um, maintenance, discussion of maintenance and the amount of time between maintenance intervals. And if that was averaged out, the airframe would be around 12,000 hours total time on it. Uh, the flight reviews on these individuals are unknown, but they were both involved with the CAP. So it was very likely that it was less than um, one year for each of them with their form fives. And like I said, one was DPE and CAP lead tow pilot glider instructor. Um, you know, both experienced people. This is repeats from the uh, prior years or the prior year. Take a look. We looked at this picture, but they took off, basically went off to the right, crashed like this. This picture you may have seen from the TV footage and stuff like that. And this is what they think is the major culprit. This is actually one of the rudder cables uh, that they found completely frayed and broken. Um, and one of the reasons why is within this airframe around near the pulleys, cotter pins are put in um, to basically keep the cable from jumping off, but the pulley had stopped turning and the cable had was fraying against that cotter pin and it had not been caught and had appears to have been doing it for a long period of time. Um, they found this to be on others also. It were three pulleys in the underfloor area, each had thick black grease deposits. The elevator cables and right rudder cable had multiple frayed cables and shiny degraded areas that indicated excessive wear. 
The right and left aileron cables in the area of the upper fuselage pulleys also exhibited areas of frayed strands. The aircraft also was pretty rough, even though it had recently come out of an annual inspection. Um, here's some other pictures from the NTSB document of how things looked uh, on the airframe in, in terms of, you can see the corrosion on the cylinder barrels, uh, the spark plugs, you know, other airframe, the trim tab, if I recall correctly, uh, linkage was specifically mentioned. And this is from the NTSB, the airplane exhibited extensive corrosion damage on the cylinder, engine cylinder, cooling fins, wing surfaces, elevator control connections, elevator trim chain, control rod, tailwheel assembly, control rudder rod connections, and, and ignition harness leads. Um, I had mentioned before, because had already had a little bit of a heads up on this, that you wanted to watch for the final, which is now out there. And I talked about some takeaways back then, but since then we've had a few others that I would add to this. And one of them is you really wanna be aware of who's doing your maintenance and to what level they're doing it. Um, the mechanic involved in this accident was also associated with this other accident here. Uh, that's what this picture is of another accident in which a bunch of skydivers were killed in a King Air uh, accident. And if I remember correctly, and I'm putting a big if to it, that aircraft had been in an accident and they repaired it, but it required full left rudder trim in order to fly. Uh, and they had been flying it with full left rudder trim for quite a while. Uh, i.e. it was known that the aircraft was just not right, but they, they kept flying it. Uh, you know, same, not, same mechanic was involved in both accidents. It brings up what I've mentioned already, the age and condition of the tow fleet and the maintenance and expanded and also the helmets for the tow pilots is that may have helped one of the pilots in this particular accident. And I, I'm gonna defer for a second to Bill and Daryl, because I, I know, you know, Daryl has an a &P certificate. Bill has been involved with clubs and uh, helping on the maintenance scheduling, maintenance oversight. You guys have any comments? Uh, yeah, this is Daryl. Uh, seeing that control cable and the fraying and the cable is just appalling. Um, you know, when we're doing an annual or even a hundred hour inspection, we should be looking at those cables, making sure the pulley is moving. And you're always suspect of the cable around those pulleys. And some there's, sometimes there's something called a fairly, which is not a pulley. It's usually a nylon or a wooden bushing that the cable travels through. Um, but maybe a tip for people who aren't used to uh, doing maintenance on airplanes, if you're doing a pre-flight, um, move those controls to full deflection and don't just see that they move, but also listen because I'm willing to bet this thing was making a lot of noise uh, on the pre-flight when you move that rudder back and forth. Yeah, and if you, if you look at last year's and what is described in the NTSB report, they had a hard landing and they came to a stop on the runway and the flight instructor got out and walked around the aircraft looking at it is to bystanders it appeared that they recognized something was not quite right with it and got out to take a look at the aircraft before they took off. Um, you know, it, it is one of those things if they had decided maybe to look at it a little bit more in depth, pull off the runway completely, who, who knows? You know, they may have found something, but it, this was suspected almost immediately um, when they got to the accident site because they found basically a loose cable to one side of the rudder and, you know, other cable working okay. Another place that you can look real closely at, and we might be able to see that when you get into some of the Pawnee accidents, any place you can see a control cable that has a uh, swedge fitting to it 
look at that because there's supposed to be some of the cable through the swedge fitting. Uh, we actually had an aileron cable come yeah. apart in flight. Luckily, the guy was able to fly it, uh, fly it using just uh, elevator and rudder and uh, got it safely on the ground, but he had no ailerons because the aileron cable came across in, uh, part in flight. And that was uh, determined to be a maintenance issue. Uh, the uh, maintenance guy replaced the cable, but he didn't have his go, no go. And uh, it pulled apart. Now, chances are during pre-flight, everything looked good. It would have looked good to the pilot right there at his feet, uh, but it came apart in flight. So any place you can touch a cable, you know, touch the cable, look at the uh, swedge fittings, um, a lot of people recommend it, you know, with a gloved hand or with a rag, run your hand down a wire. And if it snags a piece of wire, it's time for that cable to be replaced. Yeah, if I recall correctly, and again, I, I, I'm going off of memory here, which is not that good. Um, this was right at the aft bulkhead behind the rear seat where the cable came into view um, into the tail cone area which on a lot of L19s you can actually see. I don't know about on this one. A lot of them have a snap cover um, to it, that, but a lot of others don't. So it, it would be an easier cable to see in this aircraft as compared to some others on where it had broke, which was a little bit of a surprise. Uh, this one I'm just noting, this was a very dramatic accident associated with tow. We went over it a lot uh, last year. Uh, you can go back and take a look there. We're still waiting on the final, so I'm not going to get into that one much more, but just to highlight that it's still out there. This one we got into a lot also, but it is now a final uh, since the last time we did this program. They've come out, and again, what I've done is put in red what is new information from what we've covered in the past, wrong surface or wrong airport landing. Um, one thing that is interesting, you'll notice the asterisk, which is mostly from what I had last year is FAA data uh, on the NTSB report has the flight review is noted there, but it's conflicting data between the FAA and the NTSB on that. Uh, same thing with medical certificate, uh, conflicting data between what the NTSB believes and the FAA believes um, with it. I hadn't specifically noted, uh, which was unusual, this had come up in the prior part to it, that enforcement action was initiated, that has been resolved with whatever level, and we now have what the airframe age and hours are on it. Uh, it was a Cessna 182, I think, golf model, if I recall correctly. It was also noted that the pilot did not provide statements to the FAA. That's from last year, but this is what is new in the NTSB report, that the pilot stated he had difficulty locating the runway in the nearby cornfields and mistakenly aligned the airplane to land in the long swath of corn and was over the corn stalled and impacted the ground. This is, I noted this in our prior stuff and, you know, from an organizational perspective, I always have to bring this up and something to think about is what is the impact of an accident on your organization? You know, we in the FAST team talk about it, flight schools, air charter, corporate operators, all of that, but it holds true for soaring clubs too. And, you know, it's, it's sad. I, I don't know the exact details because I didn't know any of the members, but I did specifically, it caught my attention when I found that the um, three gliders from this club, at least I, I knew what they were, showed up for sale on barnstormers.com. And then correspondingly, the website was pulled down, changed ownership, whatever. What it, what it strongly suspect is that the club decided to dissolve after this accident had occurred for whatever reasons it may be loss of tow plane you know other things going on that came around either highlighted or more so probably a result of the accident and that's something you always have to think about and recognize is if you are in an organization that does have an accident it's going to be exceptionally traumatic for 
and personal for a lot of people. And it's gonna have a difficult long-term ramification on your organization also. Picture from the NTSB as it came to a stop in the corn. <laughs> Not the first time I've seen a Cessna like this in the corn uh, in my career. And pilots misidentification of a cornfield for the destination's airport runway, subsequent aerodynamic stall. Takeaways with this, I didn't hit upon them significantly before, but here is for any organization, you really do want to know who is flying your aircraft. Uh, you know, the, there's some responsibility there for the club and the organization. You also want to make sure, you know, that people are appropriately medically certificated, have a flight review, are capable, proficient with it. And I bring this up because I had one of our safety reps here in Boston called me very surprised. Uh, things are changing for all of us on insurance on aircraft. And he had last year's and this year's renewal forms. And he says, do you know what changed is now the insurance company, his insurance company is asking for a very specific date. When was the date of your last flight review? In prior years, it always asked, do you have a current flight review? Yes or no. They changed their renewal form, the company he goes through, asking for a specific date within the preceding 24 calendar months uh, for a flight review. Tow pilots, we talk about spring checkouts for glider pilots, but you know something may want to consider for tow pilots too. And I always kind of look at this, it catches my attention, is what do we have for tow pilot recurrent training? is many of us, uh, probably even myself included at some level, is our recurrent training on towing is just the discussions in our hangar talk and when we're out there or feedback that we end up getting from the glider pilots uh, informally uh, on whether it was a good tow, bad tow, why, why not. So something else just to put out there, we talk about it for all pilots, but it's something that really hasn't happened or been discussed, it seems, that much. And I, I throw that out there as a takeaway. So that moves us into the accidents that did occur in this past fiscal year, fiscal year 2021, and only a couple of them, thankfully, uh, very small. This is one of those that goes back kind of to what we were talking about a little bit earlier, and thankfully this had a very positive outcome. This is the identifier. It is a final report, uh, part 91 glider tow in a Piper Pawnee 235, the end number. Non-fatal, uh, I think just bumps and bruises, which is wonderful, if at all that. But what it was, was a flight control system malfunction failure. Uh, we mentioned that earlier. Um, Bill was talking about the circumstance he had with the loss of um, at their club in the past, loss of aileron control, I believe. Pilot, ATP 79, flight review, just nine months, 15,000 plus hours total, 500 hours in the make and model, flying under basic mid. The FAA did go on scene. And like most of our co-planes, a little bit older, a little bit more higher time. Uh, was about 60 hours since the last inspection on this. And I, and purposely highlighting that because there really was no indication that this in and of itself was a maintenance issue uh, in terms of should have been caught by a mechanic or anything like that. It, you know, there was enough time and given what we're gonna see, there's definitely other reasons why this could have happened. Uh, the aircraft was flown a lot if I recall, the club had used it in a flying safari or something like that in the week prior. It was flying a fair amount that day. You know, there, there was a lot of opportunity, I guess, for something to start down a trail of uh, not functioning properly. So from the pilot during the sixth 
flight of a glider toe, the control stick felt as though it had some play within it in regards to the ailerons. The tow pilot landed the airplane and did a flight control check and noticed a little slack between the control inputs and the aileron movements out on the side. Uh, but, you know, it was doing the right thing is, okay, something's not quite right. Let me start to double check this. And the pilot came to the conclusion that secure enough and started with a seventh toe. But during the climb out, recognized the control stick inputs diminished. And then when encountering turbulence, ended up with the stick in the hand uh, separated from the torque tube uh, assembly. Um, the pilot I know did take the opportunity to talk to some people on the radio and stuff. It, you know, if you dig into the final report, it is positive in terms of what you saw happen in terms of people helping out. But what was determined is that the flight controls had become disconnected and we'll see an actual picture of it. But this bolt right here came out. You can see it right in this and dislocated uh, from this connection right here on the torque tube. And this is the stick up to the pilot's hand. Pilot did a pretty good job. You know, I got to look at my notes here, but you know, maintain control of the aircraft using just trim, rudder control, and throttle variations. So, you know, this is one of those, I'm sure one or two people after realizing what happened, patted the tow pilot on the back, which deserved. Uh, it subsequently landed on the grass runway to the right of the runway. And during a firm landing, the airplane veered off the right and the right wing collided with a berm. You know, this um, truly could have only been a serious incident uh, according to the NTSB, if uh, had been lucky and it rolled out okay without, you know, breaking things. But either way, this was something I think that was going to be reportable to the NTSB. Just a bummer that it ended up having a little bit worse outcome than it could have, but still a positive outcome nonetheless. And this is what it looks like. If you take a look, you can see the stick is detached. They've looks like they've put the bolt that fell out or backed out um, back in here. You can see the torque tube assembly and the control stick. And this is how ended up losing is the elevator uh, is controlled with these cables here, but is used as a pivot lever off of that. So it made it that challenging. And I'll probably defer here a little bit to Bill because Bill and I got talking about this. And now I'm like, all right, perfect. <laughs> Bill, I'm gonna defer to you for a moment because I am getting that my computer is not responding. Would you like to restart the program? Oh, that'd be fun. Oh yeah, um, I got it back. I'll go. Oh, you got it back? Yeah, I'll, I'll talk to this one, but uh, we had a question earlier. Somebody wanted to know what the uh, swage fitting looked like that I was talking about inspecting. Um, yeah, and that picture there, if you'd highlight the uh, cable that's running aft, back, there you go, right there, that's right the there. fitting. Yes. And if you go back to the previous slide, you can see a copper one in there, uh, just right in the edge of that sun sunlight. Uh, right there, yep. So that's where you should be able to see, I think it's about a quarter inch, maybe a little bit more of the cable sticking out. That's where it's been cut. Um, if you don't see any of that, don't, don't fly yeah. in that plane. Yeah, go ahead, uh, ahead one slide there. Uh, this is from uh, one of the Pawnees down in uh, greater Boston that was in winter storage. So you can see the bolt there that he's talking about. And uh, we actually discovered while we were down there looking at this and getting these pictures, that that cotter pin actually had been damaged during the, probably the previous season. The airplane's been in the hangar since uh, the middle of November. Uh, so as you get your airplanes out for the winter, if you haven't been flying them all winter, um, that is a spot that's very easy to hit with your feet getting in and out. Uh, I flew a uh, Pawnee for 10 years and I think uh, we ended up replacing that particular cotter pin every year at annual. And I think probably because our mechanic, and you see there's another one down there where that swedge fitting is down there at the bottom. 
Uh, the other one is pretty much uh, protected because there's another cable like that that's buried inside that torque tube, but you don't see it. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, those are easy to see, easy to spot. And the thing about cotter pins, if they've been flexed and you flex it back and it happens a couple of times, they're going to break. They're cheap. Replace them. Yep. Yeah, and it, it was a surprise. I didn't include the pictures uh, from what Bill was talking about before. We did take another picture or two to save for describing, but it, it was a surprise. When we walked up, Bill looked at this side first. I was on the other side, and he's like, oh, that's interesting, and you know, came around, and you see. And this is a hard area to reach when you're strapped into the aircraft. That was one of the challenges in this accident is you just couldn't reach back down and you know put a pin in there or, or um, put the bolt back in if you found it. Yeah, that bolt's about ankle high off the floor. So if yeah. you can touch the floor while you're flying and reaching over a stick, uh, you're a better man than I am. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, I got DH here just asked again if you could point out that fitting. Back up one uh, slide. Yep, yeah. right, right there. Yeah. So there should be three compressions. So you see the rings where it wasn't One, compressed. Two, three. Yep. yep. And if you don't see three compressions or if you don't see a free end of a cable sticking out from underneath it, uh, it's hard to see in that one, but that's a copper uh, yep. one there. Um, there's something wrong with the fitting. And the NTSB probable cause was an in-flight separation of the control stick from the torque tube assembly, loss of directional control, landing roll, subsequent ground collision. No, I think from what we've already seen, but what it does highlight to us is some of the takeaways. And by far the best one, you know, is that expanded or advanced pre-flight, uh, like Bill was saying, in the winter time or whatever is the time to sit down, you know, have multiple tow pilots, go over the tow plane, you know, with a fine tooth comb, find these things and work on getting them fixed before the next season comes up. And then also recognizing, as Bill mentioned, there's things that you may want to do every year, or it may highlight to you maybe parts that you need to have readily available um, for quick turn because they break or whatever. You know, I... I don't know <laughs> in relation to this. And, you know, if you're a Star Wars fan, you might recognize uh, this scene in the movie. For tow pilots, I know, because I, I deal with it. And there's always that saying, if you've come from um, Air Force, ops never stops type thing. Uh, you know, when you're going as a tow pilot and people are lined up, you don't intend it, but there is always a pressure that builds up uh, with it. You know, this pilot did at least recognize something wasn't quite right, but, you know, continued on. I don't know. I wasn't there, but I at least want to highlight that you got to be careful of that pressure sometimes um, to keep the operations going if it doesn't feel right. Sometimes it's okay to just stop say, hold on, let me look at this better, take a break, walk away for one minute, come back with it. And then related to the recurrent training, but also this is good because you don't get into much of this in like an initial tow pilot checkout, but, you know, recurrent training on emergency or abnormal operations, you know, most Tow pilots are familiar with the PTS and have seen some things either as a glider pilot or hanging around the glider airport. But there's really nothing that we have set um, that's a really good guidance on the different types of abnormal and emergency procedures that we've seen, other than maybe some books by Bob Wander and others that have been our Bob Wander series, I think, on being a tow pilot and you know how often have you really trained for loss of you know abnormal control or something and already here with the Pawnees and the L-19s we've, we've seen and discussed three or four events like that tonight already so something to give some thing thought to the next two um Accidents are, I think, important to glider pilots. However, they are mostly associated with hang glider towing. 
the NTSB has one of them wrapped into it. This one, the NTSB right now doesn't show anything with towing, but I do want to highlight it. It happened kind of locally. It is associated with towing in my belief and John Wood, it happened in his district, might know more. It's still preliminary, part 91 personal. What this was, was basically someone that we believe, when I say we, the FAA, uh, was trying to get in some experience and training to become a future tow pilot. And this is in a type of small, very light aircraft called a Dragonfly, specifically designed to tow hang gliders. It is designed as a tow plane. Um, you know, it's a light sport type of um, aircraft. It was fatal for one of the two. They're, uh, the person that was kind of receiving the training uh, if we were to say that, was seriously injured. The other person uh, who supposedly had quite a bit of time in the Dragonfly uh, was fatally injured. And the FAA did go on scene on this one. And in the preliminary, there's some discussion, but prior to the accident flight, both he and performed a pre-flight inspection together. After the inspection, the pilot rated passenger flew the airplane solo and performed three touch and goes. Now, it, it does say pilot rated passenger. In the eyes of the FAA, that was someone that was rated. And I put the emphasis there was rated. Um, after that, the pilot rated passenger stopped the airplane, moved to the rear seat, and the pilot sat in the front seat, uh, kind of normal. At about 400 feet above the ground, the pilot rated passenger shook the control, control stick violently and yelled something about power. He shook the controls again and yelled, my airplane, and uh, took over. At that time, the front seat pilot noted that the airplane was now low, but thought the altitude was sufficient to clear the power lines. And during the turn, the power came back, lost partial power, and banked very hard to the left and pitched nose down and fell beneath the power lines there. What I'm putting in here, and we see this occasionally, is knowing as an organization, and also if you're flying with someone else, is to know who you are flying with. Um, you know, this applies for the operator and personally, and about the maximum extent that I think I can talk about it, and John may be at the same level, is all we can say is, you may want to look at the final report on this one because it could ultimately be very, very interesting. And if you are curious, I go back here, it has the um, NTSB report number on it. Do you have anything to add on that, John? Steve, I think that, you know, you, you said it very well and, and you covered just about the full extent that we are allowed to cover at this point. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would keep my eyes and ears open, folks, is what I'm saying. The next one is listed as the NTSB as glider tow. It was, again, technically a hang glider tow. Uh, happened out in Middletown, New York. That's the number. It's still preliminary, uh, but some good information on it. And what I like about this, and that's why I'm including it, is it is very applicable to what you do if you're towing gliders or hang gliders. It, what happened here in this circumstance, it doesn't matter what was on the tow line uh, behind them. Uh, Dragonfly again, non-fatal. Uh, injuries serious for the pilot, just the tow pilot on board. Uh, had towed before, you know, wasn't somebody brand new to this um, type of thing. But it was, went up first flight of the day, basically did a practice checking the weather, uh, you know, didn't, wasn't towing anybody, just brought it, went up and ended up, everything was uneventful, looked fine, weather was good, parked the airplane, then a, later on a hang glider hooked up, performed a normal takeoff. And then when he was at about 50 feet above ground level, it lost uh, total power, lowered the nose, um, basically glide, hang glider pilot ditched off and you know he also got rid of them. It was just too much drag and ended up pancaking down into the ground. 
but when at which time when he hit the engine restarted at that point in time so now you know you've had a horrible day and now it's starting to go bad because you're out of control um and then when it became apparent disconnected as i mentioned here so i just bring up takeaways here as launch planning from the tow pilot perspective you know we put so much emphasis talking about it uh, for the glider pilots, but it's also very, very pertinent for the tow pilots too. And what are you gonna do at these benchmarks of altitude and also at these benchmarks of distance with runway remaining or past the runway? And we've talked about uh, seat belts, cushions, that sort of thing. Also in prior ones, we've talked about helmets here. You know, just back to the, um, Crash worthiness aspect is we've seen a couple of these now where crash worthiness helps. And this one is appears, let me phrase it that way. You want to look at the final report on this one too, and we'll look at it uh, next year when it comes up. But it appears to have some maintenance and possibly um, pre flight associated with it, is what initial indications are on this one doesn't mean that it is true or wholly true but that's just an initial appearance on this one right now so you may want to take a look at that and what i'm doing is kind of bring that up before we get to the motor gliders is just think back about what i've just covered here today in these few accidents and how many of them are maintenance related right just about almost just about every single one of them. And that's probably a big point I wanna give you to take away from these tow pilot operations is thinking about the condition and the maintenance aspects of the tow aircraft that you're either behind, in, or around when you're at your club. <clears throat> Do you guys have anything else to add on the tow and maintenance before we move on to Motor gliders? Uh, yes, yeah, Steve Darrell here again. Um, I think we all should be students of maintenance. And um, especially when we're flying these older aircraft, I think you said it too. We need to uh, pay a little more particular time doing the control checks, not just wiggle the rudder and the airlines and say it's good to go, go full deflection. And um, I like to always hear the hard stop when I'm doing my control check not ramming the controls against the stops, but making sure they have full deflection to the mechanical stop. Yeah, very true point, very true point there. I would agree with you there. I, I will readily admit, I think as a tow pilot, you do become more attuned uh, to the maintenance or you should. I, I'll agree with you 100% there, Daryl. All right. Well, let's move on to the motor gliders and gonna change a little bit of things up here is what I have done um, each year, I try to improve upon this a little bit, but I, on the type of glider, uh, motor glider, I try to emphasize how it is normally used. I, I do know there are some people that have what they may call sustainer engines and use them occasionally in certain ideal conditions to self-launch and stuff like that. But um, we'll take a look at a few of these and we're gonna look at the updates first. And then there were two accidents in motor gliders um, in fiscal year 2021. First one is we look at one of the um, people strolls. We did see a lot of these airframes in the past. Uh, we saw a fair amount of incidents in these airframes that could have become accidents this past year, but in fiscal year 2021, we didn't see any, which is terrific. Uh, fire and smoke, FAA was on scene. The only update we have here on the pilot info was update on the flight review. Here's, we had this one pretty much nailed in the past. Uh, this was all information we had. This is what it looked like <laughs> at the end of the flight, uh, which is not what you want. But what it was discovered is this large hole in the exhaust that may have gotten larger dur during the fire, but it 
uh, was believed to be there, and that was the probable cause fatigue failure in the exhaust system manifold, which resulted in the ground fire after landing. And the takeaways, I didn't add anything um, to them, but I do just want to note tonight, it seems once we throw motors into the mix, um, it, it seems that maintenance becomes a big, big issue uh, with tow planes and motor gliders. And in GA as a whole, it's the second highest accidental causal factor is maintenance issues behind pilot error. Um, and on motor gliders, many people know this. I, I know Dave Nadler's done a program on it that you can find on YouTube and others have talked about it. In motor gliders, you don't necessarily need to meet a part 23 equivalents or sometimes even similar standards. Uh, so motor gliders are not like airplanes. And as a result, you end up with many more failure points or single points of failure possibilities in most motor gliders. Next one was out in Nevada. I know publicly there's been a lot of debate about this final report. I'll cover some stuff here, uh, but is labeled as a loss of control in flight that was fatal for both pilots. Uh, they both had private pilot certificate. One had airplane also, the other one glider, 60 and 80. Unknown flight review on one, six on the other. They had listed both pilots as total time as 1,000 hours. I don't know if that's true or uh, a copy-paste error, as we saw in some other accidents where they listed identical time. One had 100 hours in make and model. Another one had 400 hours in it. What witnesses described saw glider performing a series of steep back loop maneuvers, three or two or three full lot loops that were only two to three seconds, then saw the left wing break away, followed by a very loud snapping sound similar to cracking timber, and then into kind of a spiraling flat spin. Examination of the wreckage did not reveal any evidence of anomalies that would have precluded uh, normal operation. Also, based upon uh, fellow input from other glider pilots, clubs, people that knew these pilots, they did say it was highly unlikely that they were intentionally performing aerobatic loops, um, that this was just not in that pilot's DNA, as you hear uh, sometimes. It was a challenging scene, because I don't know if you remember this, but this actually started a small brush fire. This is kind of between Minden and Truckee, um, up near a ski area. I know that's up there. Um, and some of the, a lot of the wreckage was damaged, I should say, from that fire. So I didn't provide many pictures uh, of it, but there's many more pictures and quite a lot of analysis in the final report on this. And what they ended up doing was coming up with the probable cause, um, and I put a little bit of emphasis there on purpose, the pilot's delayed recovery from an inadvertent spin and or spiral dive and exceedance of uh, design load limits and overload failure and takeaways. And this is what I wanna point out and why I put the emphasis on the probable is, you know, they did a lot of analysis on this and sometimes accidents are hard to understand. You know, we sit there and with what we have available, we scratch our heads and we have hypotheses. You know, it could be this, it could be that. Let's look here, let's look at that. But many times a lot of the what, why and how questions can still remain. And that's why the NTSB comes up with a probable cause based upon the evidence available what they believe was probably what happened. Not always is it 100% accurate. We do know that, um, you know, out in Denver with the 737, the old series, we had the rudder hard overs. The first one they attributed to mountain rotor uh, when they found out later it was a mechanical. Uh, but, you know, given the evidence that's available, that's what they came up with as a probable cause. And there's a little bit more to it too. You know, they basically said, why did we come up with this as a probable cause? Because we don't think, we couldn't determine anything medical. 
we see accidents like this that are medically oriented, but we didn't have any reason to believe that. We didn't see anything there, you know, and they even go into the statement, given everything that we have, that's what we think happened. Um, so, you know, I know there's, it's a little hard to come up with some takeaways on this one. I know there's a lot of debate on it. Uh, there probably will be more. Uh, it's, it's the best information, given the information that they had, it was the most likely conclusion or most probable cause that the NTSB came up with. Danbury, Connecticut, uh, right in Dan's backyard. I remember when this accident occurred, we talked about it. Um, this is with the FES um, Silent 2 electric. Well, um, still waiting on the final there. That's preliminary. This one in Utah, we do have a final. It's collision with terrain. On scene was both the FAA and the NTSB. Private and an ATP in it, near the same ages. Flight reviews unknown. Um, 4,200 hours total, class three medical. This is from before where they found it. But then what they did provide is basically the last 36 minutes, it continued Southwest along the ridge, occasionally circling, basically looking like they were looking for lift. And then the last recorded data point indicated the glider was in a right turn, which we'll look at at 185 feet AGL. And ultimately, this is what the final track looked like. This was when they were up higher, um, tracking down. The day was an exceptionally light southwest wind day uh, is what was being reported. In fact, it was very, very light. I have some notes here. Almost calm wind rope. Wind profile indicated a surface wind from the southwest at nine knots, uh, according to the NTSB. Other data I had had um, up to five, backing the south southwest through 15,000 feet and then slowly veering to it. Um, at 18,000 feet, the wind was still not even 15 knots. So it was fairly light wind uh, day, but continuing down with a few circles. Looking closer at the accident site, this is the last two circles. Um, looks like they tried to catch a thermal of some sort down near the floor valley. And then down here, and you see they were so close to the top here that the KML files uh, overlaid on Google Earth uh, show them as below the surface of the Earth and then the right turn where they collided near the top of that little hill. Don't know for a fact, uh, you know, the terrain is not as quite as landable as you would like for an outlanding. And um, Ep or Ephraim is down here, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. I, I don't know if that's where they were headed. I did take the IGC files, which is available and put that in CU and, you know, Basically, this is the last little bit here down the edge. And you can see they're just creeping right along, continually slowly falling down off of the uh, top of the ridge line down further into the valley on this. Um, you know, as I kind of replayed it back a couple times in CU, uh, my impression was they were just what I call scrapping, you know, trying to find some lift. Uh, where they could, how they could, when they could, just to get more time aloft and hopefully a little bit more distance. But the right wing hit and wrapped around the tree, snapped as the fuselage uh, continued on. Probable cause, pilot's decision to maneuver in close proximity to terrain to try to remain in an area of lift, which resulted in it. And some of the takeaways here for the instructors to be thinking about and to be teaching is, you know, we talk about this and you go through it on the bronze badge and everything else is an altitude to give up and land out. Um, you know, and that works terrific, but you also got to think about it in terms of when you're trying to ridge soar or you are up on a ridge, does that change how you measure that altitude or not? 
I put in here, this was associated with a little bit of a contest. I, I don't know if it was an officially sanctioned one. I don't recall or uh, kind of a club local contest type of thing, but there always is. And we all deal with this, whether it's in airplanes, gliders, you know, pressure that we may add on to ourselves um, because of it's an event or we're trying to make it to that last airport. You know, um, I've done not so bright things in terms of decision making myself in the past. You know, if you just kind of thinking if I just get that one more thermal and that's a hard feeling to overcome. And last but not least, this is not something that you hear a lot of people talk about or um, I don't necessarily know or can't see much of a reason why. Uh, based upon what they were giving for weather indications that this was the case. But with the longer wingspan of this glider, it is something to think about, especially when you're trying to catch thermal activity off of the ridge. But what's known as, you know, the roll authority, and I got my <laughs> toy glider tied up on the wall right now, but the roll authority uh, with the larger wing, if it gets lifted up on the far outside at, say, three, four, five, six knots or whatever, how much roll it puts in and how long it takes you to do that in your very close proximity uh, to the ridge line. And what they also know is deceptive plateaus. But basically, if you think, if you look at right where I have this marker, if you're flying down a ridge line like that and you're close, very close to the terrain and you catch a strong thermal, it lifts that outer wing and basically turns you right into the ridge line how long do you have, which is a second or two at best, uh, you know, to counteract that before you end up going over there. A couple of places you can take a look at this. This uh, picture here, looking for one, I found, and uh, I've complimented it before. I think it's a great thing to talk about risk, but uh, Chess in the Air um, has an article on this, is the risks of ridge flying, and that's where this picture here comes from. Also, you can find it. I know it's uh, covered. Actually, I got it right here. It is um, Dancing uh, with the Wind. This book, that same thing is covered there. And it's also covered, believe it or not, uh, you know, lost in the archives in Soaring Magazine back in September 1984. Um, so if you want to dig back in the archives, you can find um, some discussion about the safety and accidents associated with this. Haverhill, Mass, we talked about quite a bit. It was a local one here in the Boston area, so we knew a lot already, but that's now final, really nothing there. That's the damage that's where it ended up. New picture is this is what it looked like um, when it hit the fence, now that the NTSB has given this. And here, probable cause, Pilot's failure to utilize the proper procedure and unfeather the motorized glider's propeller prior to an in-flight engine restart, resulting in the lack of thrust and subsequent force landing. I keep the takeaway on this one simple, just checklist, checklist, checklist. Um, you know, if it followed the checklist, pilot would have flown out of that one. This JS-1C, in Texas, the final has been issued there. It's on scene for both. Some more information with the pilot here. Did have an FAA medical certificate. Uh, this is known information. What is new with the NTSB report, although the sustainer engine, it was retracted, so they don't believe that the pilot used it. However, this, like, a fair amount of accidents that we see now uh, that are fatal. Uh, we found a lot of things that would normally be considered as prohibited substances or impairing drugs um, in the pilot system. Uh, they also found a fair amount of ethanol, although they do believe that is likely a result of the putrefication uh, after death with it. But that is a hard aspect. This is what it looked like after. And 
They basically describe it as the pilot's failure to maintain sufficient airspeed, which resulted in an exceedance of aerodynamic stall spin. It is also noted, which is the case, I think we see on a lot of the reports from the NTSB, it is hard to tell given toxicology test results of how much impact something had on a person at that given time. Uh, so more so than uh, with alcohol, they will usually not include it as something in the probable cause because they just don't know how much it affected that person at that time because it affects everybody a little bit differently. But I, I'll defer to Don, or <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at Dan and saying John, and that's what it is. I'll defer to John and Dan, uh, you know, and Eric and others. We definitely have been seeing on accidents across the board, um, drug use, whether it's prescription drugs, whether it's over the counter, whether it's illicit substances. We've seen a lot more on accidents, haven't we guys? Yeah, Steve, it's John. Um, th that's correct. Um, we have that um, webinar that we've done on pilots and medications, and that's really the medications we're talking about. I mean, it's it's still somewhat rare to find an accident pilot with illicit drugs in the system. It's not it's not um, completely. Uh, it, it's not that it doesn't happen because it does. Um, but really, when we see medications in a pilot system post accident, it's usually uh, prescription medications and over the counter medications. Um, often, very often in combination that the pilot is taking for an underlying health condition um, that could be contributory in the accident. Yeah, that is, that is a true statement. I think in that program that we do, I think it, it's, we talk about it is, rarely is it the medication itself, it's usually the underlying condition as to why the person needs the medication <laughs> with it. So, a few things, takeaways there for instructors to be thinking about. You know, we kind of mentioned, but competition, uh, you know, pressures that may uh, be placed upon oneself because of it. Does that lead them to accept more hazards, make them a bit more willing to take risks? And with that, you know, drug and alcohol use, does that affect their hazard mitigation and their risk taking? with it. So it is something hard. And, you know, I know not everybody will agree with me here, but I sometimes wonder just because I've been around the country working for the FAA in the glider community, I sometimes wonder because of the lack of a medical certificate, if it is a way that people that have had challenges with that, that really want to fly lead to that. Now, all that being said, I think there's a positive part to it because there is much more of a community in the glider community <laughs> than you may find in some other parts of flying. Uh, so it's recognized and engaged upon. And then correspondingly, I think, because I've come across a lot of individuals that have had challenges with that across the country, as I've said, is so many of those have resolved those issues and may even work in helping others to resolve those issues. Uh, so it, it is interesting. I've gotten a lot of calls over the years of, hey, we're dealing with this person and, and I know we are because I've seen this before myself personally. Um, that's what clues me in. So I, I just bring it up for an awareness for the instructors and to recognize that it is something to be aware of. We're seeing it across the board and you need to be aware of it because we don't have the same medical certification requirements, which may or may not um, help us kind of catch these type of issues. But it is something that I think as an instructor and as an organization club or whatever, to work and support the community if you start to see things that could be related to drug and alcohol use, um, you know, to correct them and help people get on the correct path uh, right away. 
I'm sure that lit up the chat. <laughs> um, What's your time, Steve? Thank you. Continuing on, uh, Robert Stale, his final collision with terrain, um, private pilot, age 64. Uh, what is interesting here, had the flight review only about an hour or two before the accident. Uh, 540 hours total, <clears throat> only had 1.5 hours in the make and model. Uh, according to the NTSB data, we had flight review that lasted one hour exactly, then did a 0.5 hour flight, and then was on the third flight in the accident aircraft um, that ended up being the accident flight. On scene was the FAA. This is a statement from uh, an instructor that had flown with the pilot before uh, and talked to the FAA inspector. This is in the NTSB report. Uh, you know, may have been a pilot induced issue with the speed brakes and spoke to him about being a contributing factor. Basically what this did is it went beyond the runway and ended up in the trees had the gear and the air brakes extended, but was in the stowed position. If I recall correctly, this was a father and son. Uh, the father was the pilot. I don't know if the son was a pilot or not, but did not recall the events because of the head trauma associated with it. And this is what the glider looked like when it came to a stop. NTSB did try to get some data, but it was new to the pilot. And not everything was set up. so. Uh, where they thought they could get IGC files. They found this to be the case. And probable cause was the impact with trees and could not be determined based upon available information. But think about experience and new types, flight reviews, what are you doing, especially if it's associated with a new type checkout. This was another tragic accident we had up in Pennsylvania, uh, a LAC 17B. Um, aerodynamic stall spin and looked up and saw the airplane about 0.5 miles away going down. This is what a witness reported. This is what it ultimately looked like in the KML file uh, overlaid on Google Earth. Um, showed pilot was going a different way back home, was on the return portion of it. Don't know if it was intentional or not. I was nervous. I This is an accident, not realizing it, but I kind of saw it, it before I even heard about it because I looked on glide track, um, glide port arrow or something that day. And I noticed um, here in the Northeast, this flight, and it just ended abruptly on this ridge near some power lines. So it made me a bit nervous and was sad to hear that it was an accident. Um, but zig back, then ended up entering a right-hand turn, and then that's when the data was lost. They believe critical angle of attack while climbing in thermal lift, and correspondingly, it was also fairly low altitude, resulted in aerodynamic stall spin. Takeaways, I'm just going to add something to really talk to your students about is the dangers of thermaling on a ridge. Uh, circumstances where you may want to try to work a figure eight uh, to take advantage of a thermal that may be climbing up the side of a mountain or a ridge versus trying to do a full circle. Um, you know, we see the same thing. I, correct me if I'm wrong, was it the Corey Lydell accident in the East River? You know, making the turn with the big tailwind. Uh, it ended up hitting the building. You know, we see the same type of thing in gliders a lot. Marathon Florida, that's preliminary still. Bend, Oregon, preliminary still, so we'll get to it in the future. Lakeport, California, preliminary still. So that brings us to this year. Tulsa, Oklahoma was an experimental amateur home built. Uh, Monet, or Monette Moni, <laughs> if I'm pronouncing correctly. It is preliminary, but part 91 personal a small single place uh, touring motor glider. That was the end number. It was registered under a previous owner. However, they did cancel um, the registration back in 2013. 
uh, on it. And it was fatal for the pilot. On scene was the FAA only. Uh, pilot by the FAA is listed as a student pilot, did have a student pilot certificate um, in the past, age 41, flight review or endorsement unknown, no indications that the person had any training other than 10 hours, nearly 16, 17 years prior. Um, I don't know another way to word this, but the pilot was known to the FAA. Uh, and that's probably the best way I can uh, get that information across. And on the airframe, an airworthiness certificate had never been issued on the airframe. Even though it was registered, it never did receive uh, an experimental airworthiness certificate. It did not have operating limitations or anything like that. The amateur built glider in an accident near Tulsa, fatally injured, entered stall spin, terrain under unknown circumstances. And this is what it looked like after. This is a very short video clip of the accident itself. You'll be able to see it come into view up in the kind of upper left-hand corner if it decides it wants to play, but oops. Well, looks like it's not going. Looks like it's going to be temperamental today. We'll try one last time. There we go. It just took a little bit extra. Well, maybe it's being temperamental now. <laughs> so if you look in the upper left-hand corner near the trees, right after this car passes, see it come down and impact significantly. That is about as far as it made it. This is right by the East 21. Um, street, these trees right here. And we'll look at more in that probably in the future when it gets beyond preliminary. The other motor glider accident, and this was a bit probably a bummer for the aircraft owner, because this is something that normally is just an incident, but in this case, it ended up becoming an accident due to the amount of damage. Uh, Jumongo motor glider, it is a touring motor glider. I've flown them a few times. I like them, definitely. Um, was non-fatal, injuries none, uh, which is good. On scene was the FAA is well-experienced pilot overall. I would assume like retired airline pilot or something like that, but had private pilot glider, age 75, had a flight review 14 months prior, 3,600 plus hours total, 170 in the make and model, basic med, um, on seeing the airframe for what it was, was a little bit older, a little bit more time, but nothing there really indicated. But what happened is landed gear up and slid off the edge of the runway, striking a runway light. And the damage ended up being extensive enough that it ended up classifying as an accident. And takeaways from this, we actually got this kind of from the pilot in their recommendations um, to the FAA was checklist usage. The pilot had not been flying for an extended period of time and said, you know, I, it also was a change in my usual procedure because of how they had entered the pattern uh, was different and everything and that they forgot to do the checklist with it and wanted to emphasize how important checklist usage was and also how important it is to be attentive when um, you haven't flown for a long period of time. And if things are changing on how important it is to keep track of those things. So that gives us a good overview. We're right about at the hour and a half now. So I'll bring this into a wrap up here and we can answer some questions in a little bit for those that wanna stay on. But 
you know, you've heard from me before that safety is more than just not having an accident. You have to be a bit proactive about it and engage to try to avoid the accident, work in recognizing the hazards and mitigating those risks. And that brings up what we've seen here as the major issues. And anybody jump up <laughs> and either agree or disagree or add to this list, because this is just what I noticed from what we saw. Maintenance issues here tonight, especially on tow aircraft. Pilot capabilities or abilities, aeromedical factors, checklist failure to follow procedures. I know for us fast team folks, we're always assigned to review that with our local GA community. The dangers and hazards of trying to thermal at low altitudes. Um, that's been one that we've known within the glider community for a long, long period of time. And that leads to flight with terrain or, or flight into terrain or loss of control that we end up having with it. So those are kind of the major issues with it. Now you wanna think about how close were we? Have I been, are we to having an accident? You also wanna assess what you're doing. Is it really, really safe? Because sometimes, you know, from your perspective, you might think it is, but from getting a different perspective, it may not be. Uh, <laughs> So I also want to put in a little bit of a plug only because I've talked about the organizations a little bit more this evening. And that's a big part of the glider community is the club organizations is I do know the Soaring Safety Foundation has a site survey outreach uh, that's usually worked with Bert Compton. Uh, what they do is they share the results of their site survey with only the board members and those chosen by the board of their individual uh, clubs. So, you know, the only ones that know basically are Bert and them. Uh, but there also are trends that are seen uh, across many. And that's something that, you know, the Soaring Safety Foundation engages on in a whole and it may help. It will really help your club if you take the opportunity to get a site survey, which is done free of charge, and give you some insight on what you, your club, your operation may be able to do better to help avoid, you know, insurance claims or, you know, heaven forbid, tragedies such as we've seen here tonight. I've also hit upon a lot of different takeaways for the flight instructors. And I'm just gonna quick review on those, is the age and condition of the tow fleet, the significant maintenance and rebuilds uh, era that we seem to be entering with it. Maintenance and the expanded or advanced pre-flight, uh, you know, Bill, Daryl, I, all of us recognizing that. Helmets for tow pilots I've brought up for consideration. Think about who's doing your maintenance, you know, verifying that you're getting the appropriate maintenance done on your aircraft. What are the club and organizational responsibilities uh, with the pilots? Recurrent annual tow pilot training to think about, whether it be advanced tow pilot training and more on emergency abnormal procedures. We talked about sometimes it's okay just to say no. <laughs> As a tow pilot, you know, you need that break, whether it be for human factors or to assess the situation. We talked about this, this fits back maybe a bit with a club and organizational, know who's flying your aircraft, who you're flying with. Launch per planning, specifically from the tow pilot perspective, because we teach a lot of that in the glider on the back end of the tow rope. We may not teach it as much in the front end of the tow rope than, than what we really do need to or want to. If you're out there flying, low thermaling, when to give up and land, and what's different about thermaling in the mountains along the ridges versus flat terrain. The dangers of thermaling on a ridge, we talked about that a little bit. What you might have is pressures on your decision-making we talked also about uh, the role in the outer wing thermal aspect on thermaling on the ridge dangers. I 
did mention the chess in the air uh, program, which is more recent. You can go back to September 1984 of Soaring Magazine. I forget the page numbers, but it is the September 1984 issue. Checklist usage, we've seen come up again year after year. Drug and alcohol use. New aircraft checkouts and experience and types and a brief mention on the satellite trackers and what happens with an extended non-flying period, such as some of us have dealt with, uh, you know, in kind of this COVID era. I know, I know that's something that I give concern about because uh, I've taken a couple larger breaks in the last couple of years from flying. As John knows, in you know, in over like 33 years of flying, a couple of years ago, I had my first six-month break. Um, yeah, so you got to think about what it's like getting back into the cockpit after a period of time out. All that being said, the most fun part and the best part to make you a good pilot and a proficient pilot is to get out there and practice with an instructor. So I would strongly, strongly encourage you if you can, to get out there and go fly. So thank you. 